workflows, we're developing a KPF urban interface, um, which is Cone Pedersen Fox's design and urban analysis department. And we work across all the scales, but it's really projects that are either large in scale, complex in design objectives, or with regulatory constraints that we operate. And we're creating tools in three different categories, um, digital zoning or regulatory tools, design evaluation tools, um, and then starting to pair those with tools to link them to um, urban data sets. Um, and so all of this comes through research. The majority of it is applied research and practice, but we pair that with um, technology and policy research, because we think as a Venn diagram, that's where we can have the most agency in the design process. Um, and as an example, this is a, a grid of some of the analysis tools that we've been creating. So it's derived things such as sky exposure views, shadows, um, but also available data sets like civic data, like 311, and social media data, um, like Flickr. And so pairing kind of available data sets with 3D analysis, um, we can produce some interesting things. And the way we we understand this in the design process as like the introduction of the MRI or the X-ray in medicine, where it doesn't take away from the judgment or expertise of the doctor, but rather give them more information so they can make more informed decisions faster. Um, so I think there's a lot of synergy in the, the presentations in this first group, but where we treat these as a design MRI, and it doesn't take away from the expertise or the judgment of the architect or the client or any of the stakeholders, but rather gives them more information that they can be, make more confident decisions, more informed decisions um, quicker. And so just kind of a cross-section of some of the tools that we've been using um, in these categories, but really given, given a project in a new context, um, while we can draw almost like 80%, 90% from the library that we've built up over the past um, five years, um, we're adding new tools frequently given the context. Um, one of the things that happened is throughout the office, our work has become more, the analysis work has become more institutionalized and aspects of it standardized. So we're, we're often working on 80 to even 100 projects a year. So one of the things we have to do is come up with um, structures for how we work with project teams and workflows that allow us, um, to it's just the two of us, um, to work on that many projects. And so one of them, is the most common tools that are kind of single implementation we can pass off, that we can work with teams. The other one is creating um, applied solutions that are custom calibrated that we pass off to the teams to operate themselves. And then the more integrated design or part of the design team. And so for the common analysis tools, these are the things that are the most requested um, that in fact we start to package off and just hand out and they do them on, uh, the design teams operate them on their own. And there are things where they have a clear diagram, um, and through kind of years of developing these offices, um, everyone in the studio has a literacy with these, where they can they can read them. There's little interpretation, and they can present them to clients um, with little support for us. Um, and the next one is um, applying tools that we pass off to the design team, and that might be more of the cust more of the um, common tools, but they need a calibration or adaptation within client expectations or a city, or things like automating diagrams, area calculations, regulatory constraints, since the idea here is just kind of um, plug and play with no grasshopper experience. Um, and so this is an example of, we, we've packaged up shadow analysis tools, but given what um, city planning is expecting to see here in terms of how they quantify shadow impact, um, we made a custom version of this and passed it off. Um, and then the last is where we're really integrated within the design team and working iteratively. And that's where we're integrating um, multiple analysis tools or calibrating them specifically and oftentimes generating lots of options in the kind of hundreds to thousands range that really require us to navigate the design space to come up with meaningful um, design um, suggestions and solutions. And that's at different scales and different projects. So for like, um, an atrium here, uh, calibrating balconies for views and design, um, integrating different analysis and creating a metric dashboard um, for the design of a skyscraper in Midtown New York, or creating a parametric um, master plan where we're calibrating streets while trying to hit a maximum density um, and get proper daylight to residential windows. Um, and now Mandy is going to take you through some case studies and the workflows for those um, that fit into these categories and kind of see how this is manifesting specific projects. 
Um, so, as Luke explained, with these kind of three categories, really all of our, the projects that we uh, work on exist somewhere in between all of these. Um, even when we apply a single implementation, um, teams will pick up multiple ones, um, but then they get to three, they get to four, they get to five, they get to six, and then all of a sudden they want a custom analysis system. Um, so, obviously we can't manage all of that, and really all of this exists on a, on a spectrum of how computationally involved of the specific project gets. Um, so an example of a single, um, just one objective in implementation, this is our most requested diagram. We do maybe four or five of those a week every time a new project comes in, and it can be done even before design, um, even before design is even started, and has become a kind of requested deliverable with um, uh, new project presentations and feasibility diagrams, and really it's just um, view contours originating at a point and moving up in space. Um, and we did some, after a lot of iteration and kind of feedback from uh, multiple generations of this diagram, we started doing things like putting a bar graph on the side, um, automating the generation of elevation from floor to floor heights to ground floor to retail floors, and really turned it into something that a uh, team that the firm understands and a team can pick up and um, use right away. Um, the natural evolution of that was, was more intense um, building proximity analysis, um, which done on an uh, individual scale you can make from scratch uh, within a day or so, um, but we found that the diagram was being um, used and picked up so often that it, it really should, have, should be standardized and codified with a kind of calibration that moves from project to project rather than the system uh, changing. Um, so this still we'll consider on a single implementation level. We'll, we have packages of this uh, that get distributed to teams. Um, and again, the diagram get, uh, carries across many different uh, projects. Um, as we expand parameters, uh, we start going into the custom range where we build tools, analysis suites, and um, and pass them off for operation, but they can't really move from one project to another. In this case, in a master plan in Shanghai, the master planning team came up, came to us kind of exasperated because the master plan was about 30 city block size parcels, um, and they had to give semantic design, or, um, to, to design massing for each and every one of them, but each parcel had a different regulatory um, compliance standard with each of them. Each of them had different max densities, different land coverage ratios, different, um, different a lot of things. Um, so we took the client's um, uh, project brief, um, which, can, which we turned into a CSV, a spreadsheet of, um, of requirements, um, built our models around those requirements, and then uh, packaged it in a way that the team could design in Rhino and get feedback in real time and have all that data um, structured at the end of it so that they can export their floor area charts uh, per block um, and really start to expedite things. So usually this is how we get involved as um, kind of uh, consultants to help automate really difficult processes. Um, and of course, once we had that set up, we could use the same or data organization, data management system and um, use our analysis with that. So in this case, we're tracking, um, being visualized right now is daylight, but we're tracking other things. Um, the performance of the public spaces in each of those blocks and getting scores for each of those blocks. Um, this one was happening almost in real time with the designers developing um, a dynamic geometry pipeline, was piping geometry in as uh, designers were making them. Um, so really speeding things up on that point and then everything um, again, gets pushed out to reports as clear diagrams. Um, and of course, we, we do things in, in grasshopper clusters. Um, there are parts of it that we do script, um, but we found that, especially with tools that we end up passing to designers, um, visual programming interfaces kind of represent this perfect gray box. Um, that even the adventurous few, or when things break, they can open it up and start to kind of understand all the assumptive models that have been embedded into these systems. Um, and then they close it and they send it back to us and ask a question. Um, <laughs> but the, I think that relationship is key to getting um, uh, d designers on teams that even do have some computational experience to actually start using it um, and to perceive accessibility. Um, so just moving one step ahead, there's another master plan in China, but this one became um, a project where we needed to have full-time involvement with. 
um, the beyond the regulatory, uh, the standard regulatory and kind of ground space performance stuff that was happening, um, there was also priority for views from that highway that was moving across the site, um, and also highways from beyond in the distance. Um, the client specifically was interested in maintaining an iconographic skyline, um, and that exposure of that, uh, um, of that signature tower in the middle. Um, but even more complicated was there wasn't a set density for the project. Um, they wanted to maintain um, maintain the idea to test many um, many different densities with a kind of specified ratio of distribution throughout programs. Um, so asking a design team to make six density iterations of every single design iteration that they make is kind of daunting. So. Um, again, the design team came to us and asked, is there a way to automate the distribution of density and um, kind of present a parameter space along with its impact onto this very qualitative, very subjective um, analysis or uh, uh, perceived quality. Um, so on the right, or on the left, you see a couple um, of the previous design iterations and on the right you see the one that was eventually arrived at. Um, as well as in there, you'll see the density that we finally, um, that the project moved forward with. Um, and on the other end of that spectrum, one thing that are projects that have so many stakeholders and so many different moving parts that they're impossible to keep track of, and again, is when we find um, our full-time involvement is required. So for this project, our project is the two, are the two towers in the middle, or the Boston Harbor. Um, and our involvement started with uh, this interesting little guy, um, which is a specific way of calculating shadow um, for impact in Boston. Um, Boston zoning is discretionary, so everything is negotiable, but one way of calculating impact is um, figuring out how much shadow that your building's casting in one hour periods of duration, which means you have to aggregate shadow over an entire day, um, over multiple days, and then figure out where that shadow is moving. Um, which you can't really do manually um, in a time-sensitive manner. Um, so we digitized that process um, and customized it to start um, prioritizing the context specific to the site. Um, in this case, there was particular attention being paid to Long Wharf to the north. Um, this all for the to embed the objectives of the city um, as, as kind of a assumptive model. Um, and here we're since we're already involved full time, where we also apply iterative um, design techniques to kind of figure out what families of solutions there are to that, that objective, since there really wasn't a hard line, um, and presenting that to the design team. Um, from the client's objective perspective, um, we, there, was the, there was the priority of views from the tower, uh, which we talked about a little bit before, so we made an analysis for that. But any analysis that we perform from our building can be turned um, inside out with, in this case, um, another stakeholder in the project, uh, we're all the neighbors. Um, and in this case, we're starting, we're taking our analyses, take, putting them onto our neighboring buildings and figuring out um, wh why our particular design um, is considerate of them. Um, in this case, um, just for perspective, this project has been in the firm for about 10 years now. Um, uh, just to give you an idea of what, this, what uh, this, these adversarial relationships between stakeholders normally are without um, facile communication with analysis. Um, so on the right, you're seeing the, I'm getting off my <coughs> um, On the right, we're seeing a, des, a project placement from 2008 compared to the current project placement in 2014. Um, uh, showing that the neighbors, that the design is actually responding to the, um, to the objectives of the neighbors to kind of strategically place where the obstructive views are. Um, and going down to another, that, um, that stakeholder's requirements or again, and doing this on a unit to unit, floor by floor basis. Um, so I think it's always been a mission of KPFUI to facilitate communication across uh, multiple urban stakeholders when city building. Um, and that's why, kind of, that's what 
our project involvement <laughs> kind of gives to us at KPF. And we've kind of arrived at this fantastic relationship between project teams and um, our work where the, our tools are continuously developing right alongside the project themselves. Um, and really, it's become kind of a closed loop development cycle, with, um, especially our single implementation projects. But we really learn a lot from our full, uh, fully integrated projects. And I think we're kind of weaning KPF onto using more comp uh, urban computational tools um, themselves, which is why we can finally start passing these things on um, without our direct supervision. Thank you.